Welcome back. Uh, we are going to talk about MDPs with a generative model today and in particular the topic that we will eventually concentrate on is known as fitted value iteration. So the idea here is that at each point of time you're running a value iteration but because you cannot store the value function um, entirely in your memory you have to use some sort of function approximating class, some parameterized class of functions to um, to approximate the value function. So at every point of time, you're doing some sort of regression to fit the value function with whatever data you have, and that's known as fitted value iteration. So again, the idea is exactly similar to what we have been talking about, but for whatever reason, um, different communities and different authors have given different names to similar concepts so um, so this is just uh, called fitted value iteration which earlier um, we were using deep neural network to store it and it was called deep uh, reinforcement learning so the ideas are pretty similar nonetheless so what's a generative model so a generative model is a device generative model is a device to which you can give as input multiple state action pairs and it will output the uh, it will output the next state and the reward function next state and the reward function next state and the reward function okay so that's the idea of a generative model now of course typically you would have a simulator running in the background uh, and to the simulator you can give a, a state action pair and you can get an output as what the next state is according to the transition probability and what the reward function you get is now if you have a robot or something which you're running in the background then typically it a robotic model may not be a generative model because you cannot give it an arbitrary state uh, which means robot in a specific configuration and uh, give it an action and then come up with what this next transition is and the next uh, what the state at the next transition is and what the reward function is but uh, in the generative model you expect that you can perhaps modify your simulator in such a way that uh, uh, no matter what state you have, you can give that as an as an input. No matter which action among all the available actions you have, you can give any one of those actions, and it can automatically give you the next state and the the next uh, the, the next state as well as the reward corresponding to that particular state action pair. So I know a lot of students uh, in the class as well as uh, in in Center for Automotive Research who run a lot of autonomous uh, car who run reinforcement learning for autonomous cars and they don't have the luxury of having a generative model at hand because uh, the cars run as well as the environment the other cars on the road they are all running according to their individual dynamics and uh, through the interaction laws that have been hard coded and it's very difficult for you to just give an arbitrary state and expect the simulator to be to be able to simulate the uh, uh, the transition of the within the environment as well as the reward function so um, all i can say is in some applications generative model may not be available so you cannot really use the concepts that we are going to talk about today. Okay, so what's the, uh, what do you do with this generative model? So I'm going to give you a, a brief idea about empirical dynamic programming uh, for the asynchronous case. So what is an asynchronous case? Well, in the asynchronous case, you have, uh, you have multiple generative models running in parallel. each of which is collecting 
uh, you give it some state action pairs and it collects all the transitions and the rewards and then it goes to a central server where all the data is processed so either you so typically of course uh, you can either send the entire data or which is so, so that's not uh, normal what normally happens is you send the gradients of gradients for the learning okay so instead of um, giving the state and the reward you basically add the reinforcement learning algorithm within this um, within this generative model and all it does is it sends the gradients to the central server so that the central server can update the value function or the reward function and it can send it back the value function or the updated value function for the next round of uh, simulation so that's known as asynchronous so you could have arbitrary number of generative models um, and uh, regression algorithms associated with it in each of these blocks and you can uh, contact the central server every time you want to update your value function so what is empirical dynamic programming in empirical dynamic programming the idea is as follows so remember t of v um, let me try to explain it for the finite state space setting so s is finite a is finite so it's much easier to explain it in this particular setting so the bellman operator was tvs equals to max over a r of s a plus alpha um, expected value of v of s prime given s a so in empirical dynamic programming you don't have access to this uh, expectation so what you do is you use a generative model to come up with a sample mean so use generative model to get sample mean So the idea is T of T hat of V S equals to well no. Let's start with the basics. So I have S A and um, I give it as an input to a generative model. And the generative model actually gives you M samples. M samples of s prime and r prime okay now of course uh, in the case of if r is merely a function of s and a then all these r primes are going to be equal but if r also involves some exogenous randomness then r prime would be a random variable too okay so so let's say you get s prime 1 s prime 2 s prime m as samples for the next state then you compute the empirical operator this is known as empirical operator t hat v of s as max a of summation uh, j equals to 1 to m r prime j plus alpha v s prime j um, and remember this s prime j is a function of s comma a this r prime j is a function of s comma a because these are all outputs 
from the generative model where you input s comma a so you take the the max here with respect to all a so you in the generative model you will have to then put all the possible actions for every state you not for every state for a specific state you will put all the actions you will collect m samples from each action state action pair and then you will compute this empirical mean um, and assuming that assuming that r is a function of s and a assuming the reward is a function of state and action uh, all the r prime j's will be equal so what you get is t hat v s is max over a r of s a plus 1 over m sorry alpha over m summation j equals 1 to m v s prime j okay and this is known as uh, empirical dynamic programming where well it's not an empirical dynamic programming yet but starting from v0 you get v1 equals to t hat v0 you get v2 equals to t hat v1 and so on and remember each of these operators t hat are completely different uh, so let me put an index t hat 0 and t hat 1 because these these uh, these values uh, the the output of this generative model that you're getting at every point of time they are completely independent of all the past samples so this is uh, the idea of uh, empirical dynamic programming the reason why it's called asynchronous is because you have uh, a few generative models that are sending information to the central server the central server may be fusing all this information and computing the next value function and sending it back to each of these generative models for further processing now in the asynchronous case you only probe a few state action pairs at every point of time um, so let's say the number of states is 10 number of actions is 10 so you have a total of 100 state action pairs so in the asynchronous case you are only um, uh, updating uh, this you're computing this empirical uh, expectation for perhaps 10 or 15 state action pairs uh, not for all 100 state action pairs so the other option you have is to compute the uh, empirical operator for all possible 100 state action pairs and that is known as the empirical dynamic programming for the synchronous case so here all state action pairs are sent to the generative model okay and that's why it's called synchronous because um, you are uh, doing the simulation for all possible states and then for all possible actions within those states so that's the only difference between syn synchronous and asynchronous case so the asynchronous asynchronous updates will have t hat v s equals to t hat v s for s is equal to well let me give it a different name g hat v s equals to t hat v s for s is equal to some uh, capital s for s in capital s t and it's v of s for s not in capital s t so you pick a few states and then you only update some of the states um, uh, you only update some of the states using the generative model and the rest of the states you don't update okay and this is the asynchronous case and synchronous case your g hat v s is 
t hat v s for all s in capital s so you have to go over the entire state space at this point uh, for in the synchronous case okay so um if you run your uh, value iteration as or rather i should say approximate value iteration because you are not computing the exact expectation you are just uh, estimating the expectation using uh, samples independent iid samples so the approximate value iteration the idea is to use start with some v not you pick v1 equals to g hat v0 then v2 equals to g hat v1 uh, i should perhaps give it an index to g hat 0 g hat 1 and so on and this process never converges but at least it gets you close to your optimal solution so v infinity is close to v star with high probability and this kind of bound is known as pack bounds probably approximately correct so the theoretical result is limit uh, well t goes to infinity probability of v infinity minus or v t minus v star infinity greater than epsilon is less than delta okay so for every epsilon delta greater than 0 there exist capital M such that this is less than delta for all M greater than equal to capital M. So you remember M is the number of samples you are generating. Okay, so this is the kind of uh, uh, guarantees you can get uh, known as pack guarantees okay so probably approximately correct guarantee so um, this is approximately correct part this is the probability part so this is probably approximately correct uh, guarantee for the empirical dynamic programming for the synchronous case and I think the asynchronous case also has a similar guarantee. So now we have talked all of this about finite state space setting where this kind of uh, um, algorithm is very much possible and we have discussed it at length in January. Now the question is how do you extend this to a continuous state space setting? Okay, so then the idea for fitted value iteration comes in and whatever we are going to talk about is coming from this particular book, uh, this particular paper called Finite Time Bounds for Fitted Value Iteration. Okay, so fitted value iteration says, well, if S is uncountable slash continuous state space, then now you have a problem that you need to use function approximator so let's say your f is the function approximating class class f from f from s to r potentially it will be parameterized by theta but we don't want to worry about theta here so, but I do want to write it so it's potentially parameterized by theta, which would be in Rn 
and i do want to say here that uh, as n goes to n so, so as you increase the parameterization the function approximating class will become richer and richer potentially approximating the entire class of continuous functions or uh, measurable functions okay all right so so the goal here is to do empirical dynamic programming using generative model plus uh, regression regression and function approximation well it should come the other way function approximation and regression okay so i guess you you get an idea so at every point of time when you get the max um, value then you have to do a function fitting uh, which is the regression part and that is the key idea of fitted value iteration so in order to understand the kind of guarantees you can get for fitted value iteration i need to introduce the notion of inherent bellman error okay it's a very very important concept and i want you to pay special attention to this particular topic because uh, it uh, it will it will be very um important for coming up with new reinforcement learning algorithms for you in the future no matter which domain you come from all right so in order to understand the inherent bellman error of f let's first talk about distance between functions so let's say i have two functions f and g in the function approximating class f uh how do you measure the distance between the two functions so one idea is well i can uh so let's say my s was equal to r i can say the distance f minus g infinity is sup of s in r or s in s doesn't matter what fs minus gs okay so this is uh, the notion of distance between two functions in the function approximating class Uh, but typically when you are doing regression you're not necessarily using the infinity norm okay so now we need to whenever we are doing regression we are using certain norm to do the regression typically it's two norm but not always um you can pick any norm you want as the loss function so you uh you can you can come up with other notions of distance so let's say the other notion of distance is the l2 distance which is given by square root of integral over r fs minus gs ds okay oh so there should be a square here okay so this is uh, the l2 distance between f and g now remember here i am using a uh, uh, integration with respect to ds but you can say well i don't want to use ds i want to use some other measure probability measure there so that gives me f minus g2 mu um i'm going to use mu as a probability measure here so mu is uh let me write it later this is integral s fs minus gs square mu ds where mu is a probability measure over s okay so we talked about three notions of distances one is the supremum norm the second is l2 norm this is l2 mu norm 
So it depends not just on the fact that you are squaring, but also the fact that you are assuming a distribution over the underlying state space. And then the more general norm is F minus G P mu, which is no pth root. Yeah, it's pth root of integral s f s minus g s raised to p mu d s okay um, and this is the 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 i mean i don't want to say a general norm so p is greater than or equal to 1 so it's not a general norm but it is a uh, uh, quite a rich class of norms that you can consider for the regression problem. So it depends on how you are doing the regression uh, in the um, well let me actually explain it right here. So typically if you are doing the regression in the following format zi minus f of si summation i equals 1 to this square i equals 1 to say m so this particular norm is the same as this particular regression is the same as 2 mu norm where mu is the distribution over x in in the regression problem. On the other hand, if you were using minimum over theta i equals 1 to m, some weight w i z i w i may depend on x i z i minus f theta x i raised to p. If this was your minimization problem then this is the same as um, the p mu norm okay uh, so here this w i x i the weight could potentially be induced through a measure or your distribution underlying distribution in x i would be the uh, would be coming from the measure mu itself and so then w i will be equal to one so so you can pick whatever is your favorite way of doing the regression whether you are, you want to use p norm whether you want to use 2 norm it doesn't matter um, but uh, but given that you have picked the specific way to do regression uh, you are basically looking at a projection uh, you're looking at a very specific form of distance measuring distance between the two functions within the space capital f all right so so we have talked about distance between the function now let's talk about inherent bellman error of the function approximating class so to understand this idea using geometry let's say this is your space of all say measurable functions l in which the value function the actual value function sits and you have picked the function approximating class f that looks like a thin line within this space of measurable functions now let's say you pick a function f here and you plot t of f so t is the bellman operator uh, t is the true bellman operator okay and then you pick uh, say f2 and you get t of f2 you pick f3 you get t of f3 and so on and if you maybe want to draw a line then you will realize that your that every time you pick a function from the function approximating class and then you try to uh, 
and so so every time you pick a function from the function approximating class and you apply the Bellman operator, your uh, t of f moves out of the function approximating class. Okay. Um, but remember, you're always you always want to stick to stay within this function approximating class, right? So, so that leads me to the following expression. So, d. So let's say d of f comma g is. the distance between two functions d of f comma f or yeah let's say v comma f is minimum of f in f v minus f p mu oh, I want to write it as a subscript so that you know that you are considering an LP norm and you are using the underlying measure as mu so this is so if I pick a function v in the function approximating class and then I project it onto this So if I pick a fu function v uh, in the space of measurable functions and then I try to project it onto this uh, space, then I get this f star, which depends on v. So this is f star v minus v p mu. Okay. So. So this will tell you that what's the distance between a function v in the space and the corresponding fitted function which lies within the function approximating class f. All right. Now I come to the main topic dp mu of tf comma f this is the max over g min over f tg g is in f f is in f tg minus f p mu okay and this is known as the inherent Bellman error of the function approximating class F. Okay, so now we have understood what the inherent Bellman error is. So let me go back to this figure that we have drawn so this is my function f this is my t of f1 i project it back to this particular space and i get the let's say i call it uh, i want let me call it f1 prime okay and this is the distance between f1 and f1 prime okay and you do the same thing for all possible functions within this class so you do it for f2 so this is your f2 tf2 this is your f2 and this is your f2 prime and 
this is my norm of f2 minus f2 prime and so on and you can uh, compute this for all possible let's say you can compute this for all possible functions in the function approximating class and pick the one that has the maximum such distance okay and that's the inherent Bellman error of the function approximating class f now of course uh, are there situations so you might be you might want to ask are there situations where inherent Bellman error is equal to zero I want to give you two such examples one is in the case of finite MDP where s was let's say a finite set and your function approximating class f was actually the whole of rn in that situation there was no function fitting that was needed you can pretty much um, this is your rn and if you have a v here your t of v will also be within rn so t of v is in rn and therefore there is no the Bellman d say infinity of t f comma f is actually equal to zero because uh, if you pick a vector v in R n, uh, t v is also going to be in R n, and therefore the inherent Bellman error is going to be equal to zero. Okay, what about? Uh, a non-trivial case so this seems to be trivial well the other non-trivial case is the lqg problem in this case your state space is s is rn your action space a is also a euclidean space and your uh, your state transition s prime or st plus one equals to a matrix a st plus another matrix B U T or B A T plus W T where W T is Gaussian mean zero variance covariance matrix sigma and W T is independent of all the past uh, noises and the reward function R of S comma A is minus S transpose ds minus a transpose e a and d and e are positive definite matrices so if you assume that your um, your state transition function and the state space has this particular format um, so this is your transition function and this is your reward function and if you know that your transition function has this linear structure and your reward function has this uh, quadratic structure you can implicitly pick your function approximating class to be um, the class of s transpose ds minus uh, e transpose s minus uh, not f some constant uh, let me call it e1 and e2 where d is positive definite e1 is a vector in rn and e2 is a vec is a scalar so if you pick your function approximating class to be parameterized by a positive definite matrix which is a symmetric matrix a vector as well as a scalar and the function is of this particular form then this is then t of f also belongs to f and you can actually check it which means that if you if you solve the following problem max over a of r s a plus uh, take a quadratic function here and take the expectation of this of s prime given s comma a with some discount factor alpha then you will find so this is some quadratic function of s prime uh, quadratic affine function of s prime if you take the maximum you will actually find that this also has 
the same format as a quadratic affine function. So in this situation also, um, your TF uh, or, or a, picking you pick any quadratic affine function, you apply the operator T, Bellman operator T on top of it, you get a quadratic affine function. So therefore, uh, the inherent Bellman error is equal to zero. So in this case, D, T, F, F. So I'm not writing P mu because no matter which uh, measure you pick, and uh, which norm you pick, uh, the Bellman error is zero nonetheless under all possible situations. So this is another case where inherent Bellman error is equal to zero. So the idea in uh, fitted value iteration is as follows. You have, uh, you, you have a base measure mu Uh, based on this measure on S, you pick samples. Uh, let me call this. Let me call this x1, x2, x3. These are all iid mu, um, and they are all part of the state space S. And then. At every point of time, you do the following. You feed in this xi, and oh, the action space here is finite, so A is a finite set. So you pick xi, you pick an action A, you feed it into the generative model, and you get multiple samples, let's say yi. 1 comma r1 yi2 comma r2 and so on yim comma rm and then you store the following value v hat of xi equals to max over a 1 over m or 1 over m summation j equals 1 to m rj so i somehow want to tell you that y depends on xi comma a r1 depends on xi comma a so you need to make sure that the dependence is captured plus alpha v y j i comma a okay and then now that you have the target value you want the function to have at x i you do some sort of uh, linear regression. So do regression, which is given by the following way. So you compute V, which is argmin F in capital F, D, P mu of F comma V hat. Okay, so basically what you do is you have, you measure the value v hat at, so v, I have already used v here, so let me call it, let me name it v0 and let me call it v1, so that, that this is one round of fitted value iteration. Oh, and you of course do it for all xi, so you do it for all xi. So initially you generate the samples then you for each sample and for all actions you feed it into the generative model it will give you a set of uh, next states and the rewards then you use all those next states and rewards uh, average it out 
uh, take the maximum you get v hat which is the target value at that particular xi and then you do some sort of uh, regression run some sort of regression algorithm to compute the value of v1 and remember that v1 is in f now so you started with some v0 which is in f after doing the regression you got v1 which is also in f so this is your x1 this is your x2 this is your x3 and this is your v hat x1 v hat x2 v hat x3 and what you will get is um, after doing the regression you get is a function and this is your v1 okay now i'm not saying that the v1 will pass through all these points so you could also have a v1 which looks something like something like this so you could have v1 that looks uh, something different which does not near, uh, pass through the point completely um, so that is very much a possibility so there are two possible options one is you generate this sample once at the beginning of time beginning of the simulation and then you just keep that point fixed throughout your time so that's known as the single sample variant the other option is you regenerate these points x1 to xn at every point of time okay so you finish the simulation at time 0 okay you get v1 now regenerate the samples x1 to xn uh, according to the distribution mu go through this whole process again compute v2 then regenerate these samples and go through the entire process that is known as the multiple sample variant case okay so now uh, we are coming towards an end of this discussion the only last thing that i want to cover is the error bound that you get with respect to this fitted value iteration so the error bound is slightly complicated um, to discuss but here is the error bound so this is your transition probability under policy pi 1 this is the transition probability under policy pi 2 and so on this is the initial policy so let me write it rho is the sorry not initial policy initial distribution over states uh, p pi 1 is p pi i is uh, state transition probability under policy pi i okay so now you are taking a radon nicodym derivative with respect to with respect to the measure mu uh, if you don't know what radon nicodym derivative is don't worry about it uh, just skip this particular section uh, but what you actually do is you pick the you take the radon de nicodym derivative uh, over all possible take the infinite norm uh, over all possible sequence of policies you denote it by cm and now cm should satisfy a growth condition so gamma here is the same as alpha so gamma is gamma is the contraction coefficient Okay, so CM should satisfy the growth condition in such a fashion that this whole sum should be less than infinity. Okay, so now we come to the final result. So for every epsilon greater than zero, for every delta greater than zero, there exist n, there exist capital N and capital M such that this is less than equal to this expression with probability 1 minus delta for all n greater than equal to n m greater than equal to m so remember m is m is uh, the number of samples you pick from the generative model n is the number of state you pick for the function fitting so n is number of 
x1 to xn you pick iid from mu okay um, now for the single sample variant this value of n and m is slightly higher for the multi sample variant the value of n and m is slightly lower uh, but in practice you can pick any one of them either single sample variant where you don't change x1 to xn across time or you can pick multi sample variant where you change x1 to xn across time and uh, you would get uh, so the results are different or rather the the bounds are different the sample complexity bounds are different but uh, my feeling is you will get pretty similar results uh, under both circumstances you definitely want your mu to be close to the <coughs> invariant distribution of the Markov decision problem uh, under the optimal policy because only then uh, you would get perhaps the best result. Uh, that's all I have for today. In the next class, we are going to talk about uh, policy gradient methods.